Hey everyone, I'm Dre, the host and founder of the Dragon Network. Welcome to today's video. Today I actually want to talk just quickly about value-based care. So the term value-based care is something that we hear a lot in our industry and we don't always sort of take a moment to stop and make sure that everyone who's new to healthcare or who is in the IT space is familiar with what it actually means. So I thought I would just do a quick video on that and hopefully it will help. So value-based care, according to CMS, which is the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services in the US, value-based care arrangements are where providers are reimbursed on their ability to improve the quality of care in a cost-effective manner or lower costs while maintaining the standards of care, rather than being paid or reimbursed on the volume of care that they provide. It is the overarching model or the overarching concept that we are working towards to transition away from fee-for-service where providers are paid for each service that they provide and that fee-for-service model exists all over the world so it's absolutely not isolated to the US and transition to something that is more outcome-based, quality-based, best practice-based. So reimbursing healthcare providers and healthcare organizations and healthcare entities for actually making people better or keeping people healthy instead of just the payments that are currently going on in a lot of places where they just get paid for what they do. So it sounds great, it sounds like something we should have done all along, but it is quite a big transformation that uh, really every country is undergoing and the whole concept of value-based care has many, many, many tentacles. So I just wanna stick high level and just focus on the big picture right now. Four of the big underlying principles of value-based care is that it needs to be organized around medical conditions. So in order to measure outcomes and to understand sort of going in and coming out if things have improved or if things are being done in a cost-effective manner, you need to understand what the medical condition is that you're following. So you need to be able to compare it against something and to look at benchmarks or to look at expected outcomes. So it needs to be organized around medical conditions. We need to focus on outcomes, and in particular outcomes from the patient's perspective. So can they get back to living a normal life? What is the percentage of mobility that they have in the end? Is there a greater quality of life after a treatment has been performed? That type of stuff. With value-based care models, we also are seeing a shift towards being more proactive instead of reactive. So right now, there are a lot of healthcare systems in the world that are primarily reactive based. So people go there when they're sick, we fix them, we send them home. They come back when they're sick, we fix them, we send them home. So with a value-based care model, it is starting to shift some of that care into the prevention side. So we don't want them to show up when they're sick. Absolutely, people are going to still have emergencies, there's still going to be events, there's still going to be care required, but it's really looking to try to shift the provision of care more on the preventative side. So looking at primary care models, looking at you know regular checkups, keeping people's diet and exercise healthy, that type of stuff, as opposed to simply always just reacting to everything. So if you can shift the care model to more of the proactive side instead of the reactive side, it'll decrease the cost. So one of the most expensive things in the healthcare system in almost every country, if not every country in the world, is inpatient care. So you don't want people to be in the hospital from a cost perspective, if you're the payer. You'd like them to stay out. So that's one of the things that value-based care models are looking at. And the final one that I wanna to touch on, certainly not the last thing that they're looking at, but the last one I wanna mention is to focus on collaborative care models. So right now, there is a lot of redundancy and waste within our systems when someone goes from one provider to another. So we find that there are situations where tests are repeated, perhaps uh, administrative time that's duplicated, a lot of things that could be streamlined a little bit better. And so by having collaborative care models where there is information flowing back and forth, interoperability is working great, and you have providers talking to each other, you have the right people with you at the right times, that can actually um, assist greatly in a value-based care model in both reducing the cost and in improving outcomes. So we're starting to see some movement in those areas as well. I think that movement is one where we're gonna see a lot of focus in the next 10 years, 
especially with what we've seen from a pandemic perspective, we definitely have learned, and we knew all along, but we've learned very quickly that working together is much, much, much more beneficial for the patients than sticking with our silos. In a lot of instances, health IT professionals will come across value-based care in the context of payments and trying to reduce costs. So there's a lot of different programs that have been put in place already, and we're being asked to sort of shift our IT systems to support value-based care models. But a lot of times it has to do with the financial side or on the reporting side. So there's a lot of other benefits that we can look at so we can really understand as IT professionals what that value-based care model is really trying to do. And a couple of them that I wanna mention is, of course, there's benefits to the patient. So if the patient has improved outcomes and they have more collaborative care, then the patient definitely is going to be happier in the end, they have a better outcome and what could be better than that. Patients also have a higher satisfaction rate because there's more touch points along the way. And if there is preventative medicine, that's a focus of a relationship. There has been some studies to suggest that when there is more of a focus on the preventative, patients are just satisfied with providers overall because it makes them feel like they're being cared about. Not that they're not being cared about when they're sick, but when someone's actually taking the time to try and keep them healthy or get them healthy and have them sustain that over time, that sort of builds the trust relationship with providers a whole lot easier than when you're in a situation where there's not a lot of options, you don't have a choice, you're just stuck somewhere and they're fixing you because you're broken. Reduction in the overall cost of healthcare is of course why a lot of the legislative programs have been put in place. So in the US, uh, CMS is trying to reduce the cost that they spend. Canada is the same way. So we are spending from a government perspective an enormous amount of money on healthcare. And a lot of that, if we can shift appropriately over to value-based care, reduce the cost, increase the outcomes, it's gonna be a win-win for everybody. So with value-based care models, one of the other benefits that is likely to arise over time is some um, connection between pricing and outcomes in the supply space. So right now, medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, anything like that, the pricing is a little bit all over the map for some things. So if you can tie things to best practice, if there's very, very clear standards of care, if everyone's following things, if they're tied to outcomes, then we may see some stability in the pricing of those things and hopefully they'll be better tied to what the actual outcomes are. As value-based care models are put in place and as the organizations mature around those models, we start to see standardized best practice. So it is going to be very, very interesting to sort of look at the outcomes over time, to start to see as the reimbursement starts to shift away from fee-for-service or capitation type models into this value-based care model, where those standards come from, IT has a huge, huge role to play in the standards. So as care is standardized, as these workflows are sort of set out, and as we're looking to track the outcomes with interventions, so did this intervention garner the outcome that we're looking for? It's IT that keeps track of all of that. It's IT that builds the workflows in, that puts the clinical decision support there, once the uh, best practice is, of course, defined by the clinical and medical communities. So all of that setup, making sure it's in place, making sure the systems support that, making sure they can report on it, making sure business intelligence and everything is behind it is an enormous amount of work for IT. It's not going to change. So the shift to value-based care may have started as a conversation around reimbursement and really how do we reduce the cost of care? How do we keep people healthier for less money? But IT has a massive, massive role to play in that, along with, of course, the legislation and everything else. So again, very quick, high-level overview of what a value-based care model conceptually is. I will very likely in future videos go into a deeper dive on some particular value-based care programs because they do in their own unique way have impacts on IT that I think we would benefit from talking about because they certainly drive the prioritization of our projects, the focus of our health leaders, our boards, our C-suites, sort of what they're looking at and how they're moving forward. So definitely stay tuned uh, for future videos on value-based care type things. Just wanted to get this video out there so that we have it to refer to when we're thinking of the model in general and what it really means when we hear that term. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and I will see you again next week.